Hi all, let's talk muscle metabolism. So throughout this lecture, there'll be some questions, some practice questions in green, and you may wanna pause the video to answer those questions before we move on. So there are three topics we'll talk about. We'll review ways in which muscles can make sufficient ATP, how VO2 max and respiratory quotient relate to metabolism. And finally, we'll talk about metabolic differences between muscle fiber types. So one of the most important parts of muscle metabolism is how muscles make enough ATP. You know that muscle contraction and all the calcium pumping, et cetera, uses a lot of ATP. A lot of ATP gets hydrolyzed. And that ATP needs to be resynthesized in some fashion. So there are three general ways that can happen. The fastest is the creatine kinase system where this enzyme, which muscles have a lot of, skeletal muscles have a lot of, and cardiac muscle, uh, this enzyme takes the high energy phosphate from creatine phosphate, puts it back onto ADP to rapidly synthesize ATP and uh, release creatine. The second, process, which also gets going quickly, is anaerobic glycolysis. So glycolysis that happens without any uh, air. So this image uh, reviews anaerobic glycolysis that's similar to how it's shown on your metabolic map. And the glucose for this process can come from two places. The first is from glycogen that is within the muscle cells. And glycogen phosphorylase is the enzyme that cleaves off phosphorylated glucose from the glycogen. Again, that gets um, isomerized to make glucose 6-phosphate. So you note here, no ATP was used in order to already get phosphorylated glucose. The other way to get glucose for the process is it can come in from the blood by glucose transporters, either GLUT1 or GLUT4. And then that glucose needs to be phosphorylated to enter glycolysis. So we have the process of glycolysis here. I want to point out one of the intermediate steps is catalyzed by dehydrogenase and produces NADH, right? And uh, in order for glycolysis to continue, that NADH must be reoxidized to NAD+. And in the absence of oxygen usage, so anaerobic glycolysis, the way that occurs is that pyruvate, that was generated during this pathway gets reduced to lactate and the NADH gets reoxidized to NAD+. So now there's NAD+, that can be used by this reaction and glycolysis can continue. Lactate leaves the cell together with a proton, right, and goes into the blood. And most of that lactate will be utilized by the liver uh, used mostly by um, gluconeogenesis to make more glucose. So here's your first practice question. What mechanisms rapidly activate glycolysis in contracting muscles? Well, uh, calcium and AMP are two small molecule activators that are produced during, in the cytosol, during um, muscle contraction that also activate glycolysis. So this just shows an image over here of how muscle contraction causes calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? It is used in the process of contraction, but it also activates glycolysis. And muscle contraction, we know, produces lots of ADP. The enzyme adenylate kinase takes ADP and makes an AMP and an ATP. And this AMP, adenosine, adenosine monophosphate that's generated, also activates glycolysis. And it does so in several different ways. So the first way is that both calcium and AMP are allosteric activators of muscle glycogen phosphorylase. The second way is that GLUT4 glucose transporters that are kept inside um, in on uh, intracellular vesicles most of the time until they're activated, the AMP and calcium activate those vesicles to fuse with the plasma membrane and increase the amount of GLUT4 
for glucose transporters, allowing more glucose to enter the cells. And the third way is that both calcium and AMP activate this rate limiting step of glycolysis catalyzed by phosphofructokinase 1. So this kind of a cool that calcium and AMP, which are generated naturally in the cytosol by muscle contraction, also activate and really increase the rate dramatically of uh, glycolysis in muscle cells. All right, and then the third way, which gets activated more slowly, is aerobic metabolism. And this is what in the long term generates the most ATP for sustained activity. And this image just sort of summarizes aerobic metabolism. We can oxidize fatty acids, we can fully oxidize glucose, and we can oxidize the amino acids. Right? And muscles do all of these. And this process of oxidation produces FADH2 and NADH and lots of acetyl-CoA, which we know enters the TCA cycle, which is um, shortened here, short form of it, which also produces lots of NADH and FADH2, all of which fuel the electron transport chain. And this is where we use the oxygen we breathe. This is the aerobic part. Oxygen gets reduced to water. And in the process, we make a big proton gradient. So these complexes in the mitochondrial outer uh, inner membrane pump protons to make a large proton gradient. And it's this proton gradient that fuels the synthesis of ATP at ATP synthase or complex five of the respiratory chain. So that's aerobic metabolism. And this diagram just illustrates um, schematically, roughly, the time scale for these different processes. So there's a small amount of ATP in muscle, and that can give us a couple of seconds worth of activity um, of muscle contraction. But that ATP needs to be regenerated, and creatine phosphate can give us several more seconds. Then anaerobic metabolism kicks in. And aerobic metabolism is slower. It takes time for oxygen delivery to um, get fully activated, get enough oxygen to the muscles uh, for aerobic metabolism, but that's what can sustain for um, a long-term activity. Okay, so what happens if a muscle is worked more than its capacity to make ATP? Well, it can cause muscle damage and that's usually mild, but severe muscle damage by overwork is called rhabdomyolysis or breakdown of muscle fibers. Myoglobin is released uh, and causing red urine and creatine kinase as well as other proteins are also released into the serum. Creatine kinase is a commonly used clinical biomarker of rhabdomyolysis. So practice question. What inborn errors of metabolism could increase the likelihood of rhabdomyolysis? Muscle glycogen phosphorylase deficiency could do this. Muscle phosphofructokinase 1 deficiency can do this. So remember that's in glycolysis. Muscle fatty acid oxidation deficiencies can also uh, cause rhabdomyolysis. More on the um, the longer term process, because this is, we're talking slower oxidative metabolism here, as well as mitochondrial mutations, deficiencies in the respiratory chain. Okay, topic number two, how do uh, VO2 max and respiratory quotient relate to metabolism? So VO2 max is defined as the maximum volume of oxygen per kilogram of body weight that one can use per minute of physical activity. And here's an illustration of a man doing a VO2 max test. He's increasing workload and when his um, oxygen use reaches a steady state, even with an increased workload, he's at his VO2 max level. And it's a measure of cardiovascular fitness and aerobic endurance, and it's related to lung and heart capacity, our vasculars, um, yeah, the, the capacity of our vasculature to deliver oxygen, as well as muscle efficiency. And muscle efficiency mostly relates to our mitochondria, how effective our mitochondria are, and how well they utilize oxygen 
as a substrate for complex five. So this is all based on the fact that the vast majority of oxygen that we breathe is used by complex four of the electron transport chain. Um, now respiratory quotient is defined as the volume of carbon dioxide produced per volume of oxygen used. And it indicates the primary macronutrient that is being oxidized. So practice. So if you review, um, oxidizing which macronutrient provides the highest respiratory quotient. So the respiratory quotient for carbohydrates we know is one, whereas the respiratory quotients for fats is about 0.7. And we can uh, look at the structures of carbohydrates, primarily glucose made from glucose or fatty acids and see how this occurs. So if we write out the um, reactions, the chemical reactions for fully oxidizing a carbohydrate and note that carbohydrates already are partially oxidized we see that six oxygen are used to fully oxidize a carbohydrate to water and CO2. So the respiratory quotient is six CO2 divided by six oxygen is one. Versus a fatty acid, and here's the example of palmitate C16 saturated fatty acid. It's a very common fatty acid in both our diets and our storage. We see that in order to fully oxidize it to CO2 and water, we need 24 oxygen. So the respiratory quotient is 16 carbon dioxides per 24 oxygen, or it's about 0.07. All right, so the third topic is looking at the metabolic differences between muscle fiber types. And here's an illustration, a cross section of a skeletal muscle showing the three basic fiber types. And this is stained to show mitochondrial abundance. So type one fibers are also called slow oxidative fibers. They're slow to contract, but they're also slow to fatigue. And you see they have lots of mitochondria is illustrated by this dark staining. Type 2A are fast oxidative fibers. So they're fast to contract, fast twitch fibers, um, and me sort of average medium in terms of fatigue. Um, and you see they have an intermediate level of mitochondrial staining. Type 2B fibers are called fast glycolytic fibers, very low mitochondrial abundance. They're fast twitch, but they're also fast to fatigue. All right, so a practice question. So what are the metabolic differences between these fiber types, okay? And so to practice and think through this, you may wanna fill out this chart. You might wanna stop this video and fill out the chart on your own. So what we're looking at here is glycogen content, myoglobin content, the level of lipoprotein lipase in the um, capillaries of the muscle fiber types and resistance to fatigue. And we're comparing the type one slow oxidative and type two B, the fast glycolytic. Okay, and here are the answers. So for the slow oxidative, they don't have a lot of glycogen in them. They are primarily oxidizing fatty acids or glucose coming in um, from the blood, whereas the um, fast glycolytic fibers have lots of glycogen. That's how they're doing anaerobic glycolysis is largely by, ox by um, converting the glycogen into lactic acid. Slow oxidative fibers have lots of myoglobin. The myoglobin is important for delivering oxygen to the mitochondria and the fast glycolytic don't have much myoglobin. They don't have a lot of mitochondria, so they don't have much of a need. Lipoprotein lipase is important for getting fatty acids into muscle coming from chylomicrons and VLDLs in the bloodstream. The slow oxidative fibers have lots of lipoprotein lipase activity in the capillaries uh, and the, slow, the fast glycolytic don't. The slow oxidative are 
um, highly resistant to fatigue. They don't fatigue easily, easily, whereas the fast glycolytic has a low resistance to fatigue. All right, so let's summarize what we've talked about. So the first point is that muscle contraction requires large amounts of ATP that can made, be made most rapidly from creatine kinase and creatine phosphate. Uh, next, from anaerobically, from glycolysis producing lactic acid. And finally, in a sustained fashion by aerobic oxidation of both glucose and fatty acids. The second thing is that muscle contraction that is forced to exceed ATP production causes muscle damage and that mutations in muscle metabolism plus exertion can cause muscle damage. Carbohydrate oxidation produces fewer ATPs, calories per gram, but a higher RQ compared to fat oxidation. And finally, the different fiber types express different genes to allow them to specialize in fast glycolytic versus slow oxidative metabolism.